And you should introduce your work. Okay. Yes, sure. I, I was about to do it. Uh, so thanks a lot for this. And I'm going to use your article in this talk. So it's, uh, <laughs> let's keep on with that. Uh, and so, oh, you see, yes, you and, uh, and so uh, this is a joint work uh, together with Sylvia and Toffoli, who is a PhD student uh, in, uh, in mathematics in, uh, in Berlin. So that's, that's this interdisciplinary work at some point. So that's what we, we, we try to do. And uh, so you know, I'm going to introduce uh, some of the issues uh, about this talk. It's going to be about low, low dimensional topology as visual mathematics. But in the course of the talk, I think that it will become clear what we mean by visual, I mean, so it's much more than uh, visual mathematics as we will see. So this is the outline of the talk. I uh, will first uh, introduce some of the issues we're going to discuss. Uh, then I will uh, let, uh, uh, let uh, we'll leave you with Sylvia. And uh, she's going to present this proof, uh, which is going to be our case study, which is the road term proof. And before that, she's going to give some uh, preliminary definitions uh, that are necessary to understand the proof. And then we're going to discuss what seeing is in topology and give some conclusions. So, as an introduction, let me quote uh, Brenda Marvor. <laughs> Basically, exactly, uh, I'm happy to, to just uh, uh, start from uh, when, where we started this morning. So, I think that uh, today you were, you were pointing at the fact that uh, there all this, there's been this tendency towards and this attention towards the mathematical practice. And all these conferences about the philosophy of mathematical practice, but still, as you say here, the philosophy of mathematical practice, and I'm quoting, remains somewhat under theorized. Answers to the questions what is the philosophy of mathematical practice and how does one do it do not usually go far beyond the aspiration to study actual mathematical activity. And this is the first problem. The second problem is that it is, as you were saying today, it is not that clear how the historical, sociological, and psychological studies presented at conferences, such as this one, through the philosophy of mathematical practice, can generate a significant challenge to the approaches that assume that formal logic can provide a philosophically adequate model of mathematical proof. So we want to address these two, let's say, conceptual gaps that you're finding in the philosophy of mathematical practice. So before presenting our case study, we want to give our proposal for what the philosophy of mathematical practice should do and how it should do it, and also to, in which sense we want to also point uh, uh, to, to define in which, uh, uh, to what extent uh, this kind of uh, attention to the practice uh, represent a challenge for a more traditional standard notion of proof that we have inherited from the 20th century philosophy of mathematics. So what concerns the practice of mathematics? So what kind of object is it? And I'm happy to say that I think that the talks, some of the talks today uh, were, were going in this direction. So uh, what should the philosophy study if it studies the, the practice of mathematics? Well, we think that there are three features that are characteristic of Practice. And also, I'm happy to, to quote also Karine when she, she, when you say practices, I mean, it's important to, to keep in mind that there is a ruler of there, so there are many practices in that class. So, these are the three features that we, we think that can be recognized in uh, defining what a practice of mathematics is. So, the first is that practice of mathematics uh, has a collective dimension. It could seem a trivial point, but it's something that has been neglected uh, by the with the standard uh, philosophy of mathematics. And this collective uh, dimension, we've seen an example today of uh, how this can work, and I think crowdsourcing is very important today, and I think that it's, it's, a, it's an argument of discussion, <laughs> very, very long thing to discuss. So we want to consider in our case study how the collective dimension uh, can assume some epistemological relevance when we're doing mathematics, when we're considering um, a particular subfield. But let's say that there is this romantic idea of mathematicians working alone in their rooms and coming theorems. Uh, yeah, part of the story is true, but still they are working inside groups, uh, subfields, they have their own jargon, and we'll see how interesting is the jargon that is used in topology. And uh, they have to, to quote <coughs> Darstone, so uh, we, will, we will use uh, lots of these ideas. They have their, each of these groups have particular mental models that needs to be activated in research. So this is the first uh, 
the first uh, feature. So speaking about uh, mental models, and this is the more psychological part, but I don't like distinguishing psychology philosophy and philosophy, so uh, forget what I said. Um, we think also that the philosophy of mathematics, uh, mathematics when studying the practice should consider the fact that the practice of mathematics depends on pre-existing cognitive capacities that we have, we have born with and we have developed in uh, while uh, growing up, but these capacities uh, get nurtured by expertise. So we can't only consider perception, we have to consider how the percep uh, perception gets informed by the practice of mathematics and so how these two elements nature and nurture, let's say, interact in the practice of mathematics. And I think that topology gives a very good example of that. Um, and then finally, uh, and this is very important, and I think that some of the talks of tomorrow are going to think, are going to talk about that. Uh, the practice of mathematics involves the use of some external and material representations, and this is something very important that, uh, again, Karina has worked a lot on these kind of things. So uh, that something that must be considered when doing consider when um, when considering the practice of mathematics. And again, we will see how in this uh, case study uh, we can consider the use of the materiality of the practice. So all these features are as well to use the uh, mathematical expression. These are the human beings of mathematics uh, to some extent the practice of mathematics. So why this would uh, be a challenge for uh, to measure? for uh, the, notion of the notion of proof that we have inherited. Well, first of all, because we know that the inherited notion has been um, this idea that proofs are <coughs> syntactic objects consisting only of sentences arranged in a finite and respectable way. This is a quotation from Pennant, which uh, I, I found it in Barwise and Edge from the book on the dynamic uh, logic. So, uh, precisely, this is uh, the kind of thing that even the features of the practice that we have ident identified, uh, we have, we are forced to reject if we want to approach mathematics from a practical practice point of view. And uh, from, we want to do a practice-based philosophy of mathematics and an logic-based philosophy of mathematics. And to quote Brandon again, of course, the cost, uh, the cost is that we have to abandon the hope of establishing a general test for validity in mathematics. This could seem a very uh, a big problem, I mean, a, a dangerous drawback of uh, approaching mathematics this way. But the point, what we are trying to do today is showing that uh, this doesn't mean that there's no validity in mathematics anymore. Uh, the only thing is that uh, we have local uh, tests for validity. And so, uh, again, uh, I like the, the reference that uh, Brown today was talking about this mechanism uh, that we should assume. So if this is it, then we have to uh, understand that proofs become context dependent, so that is dependent on the particular subfield when they are considered as acceptable, and so we will see what happens in topology. And I want also to refer here to uh, two elements, uh, one element that, for example, uh, has been discussed by Jacques Lorota in the paper on the phenomenology of mathematical proof, when he's saying that what is needed in mathematics uh, are not only proofs but also reasons, and sometimes reasons are not directly uh, connected with rigor, but they are more connected with insight, understanding, and so all these things we maybe need to broaden and to widen uh, the notion of proof um, that we have inherited from the 20th century philosophy of mathematics. And so now I'll leave you with, with the CPL is going to present. Uh, Okay, so I will present now our case study, in fact an example of proof in the dimensional topology. And I try to keep in mind the, the aspects that we identified in the practice of mathematics that are its collective uh, dimension, its cognitive aspects and uh, the presence of material uh, representations. Um, so this proof is about the equivalence of the two presentation of a three manifold and um, to uh, present it, I have to give some basic definition first, and I didn't know the background of the audience, so it's, uh, I try to keep it nice and easy. But um, so I'm sorry if some people will get a bit bored if they know already. But, uh, so um, the first method I want to introduce to construct uh, closed compact three manifolds from the three sphere it's uh, by surgery, and to do so uh, we have to define mathematical knots. So a knot is a smooth, simple closed curve in the three sphere 
uh, this is uh, exactly what you would think it is. So it's an abstraction of a physical knot, just uh, it's a curve in space and it's closed. So it's something homomorphic to a circle. Um, to do surgery from this here, we want to take a tubular neighbor of a knot. Uh, and that will be something uh, homomorphic to a disc across a circle, which is a solid torus. So that is the knotted in space. So we have this uh, um, object that we want to cut it from the tree sphere and then uh, glue back a solid torus in another way in order to obtain another manifold. And uh, in fact, uh, it turns out that all the closed compact tree manifolds can be obtained in this way and uh, they can be coded by a frame knot. This is a knot with a rational number associated to them and uh, the rational number uh